trying to get me to read. And uh, I wasn't really into books with words, so to speak. My first and only crime, I shoplifted this book. <laughs> and I found this book of complete Calvin and Hobbes. It was in English, but I said, I don't care. I'm going to learn this language just to understand this book. My initial impression when I saw him was that the, the, the guy's making it harder for the rest of us because he's setting this ridiculous standard of, of excellence that hadn't been seen since the Pogo years in drawing. He just took this idea and just blew it up into this wonderful relationship. Here was a strip that was much better drawn than anything in the papers, that had a really fresh perspective, and it just took off. I got a lot of attention for a resemblance to Calvin and Hobbes. You can see how this influenced uh, Bill Watterson with Calvin and Hobbes. There are a lot of strips that are like that, where he's in kind of a fantasy world, and then in the last panel, he wakes up. Imagine if he started licensing. The first lunchbox would have sold nine billion. My friends and I even made a personal bootleg Calvin shirt just for ourselves. There we go. Oh, look at that. Watterson was coming out of more of the artistic tradition of this, look, we can raise this art up, and others were coming from, look, it, it has always been this intersection of art and commerce. Most of the time, I was just trying to meet my deadline. For Bill, it wasn't enough to just meet the deadline. You had to sort of move the bar a little bit over what you'd done previously. It can't really be contained by print or panels. It's a living, breathing thing that I think it you know, always will be. Even now, as I reread them and I continue to reread them, I discover so many layers and appreciate it more. Calvin's like the kid you want to be, you know? Even if, even if you're a 300-pound black kid, I mean, you still want to be Calvin.